Thanks to the Rotary Club of Houghton for hosting this event, and especially to uh, Michigan Technological University for inviting me here today. Thank you to the members of the local business community who joined me earlier this morning to discuss business conditions in the Upper Peninsula. And I also appreciated the opportunity to meet with some economics and finance students at the university this morning. As a former professor, it's always gratifying to be reminded of the curiosity and attention of our, our students. And all these conversations are valuable to me, and I hold them whenever I, I travel throughout the 9th District. We meet with business leaders, community leaders, and uh, more occasionally, but always uh, um, uh, satisfyingly so, we meet with students. I, the information that I receive at such meetings is valued to me as a policymaker, as it provides real-time insights into the state of the economy. The title of my speech today is A Time of Testing. Paul Volcker, then chairman of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, used the same title for a speech that he gave on October 9, 1979. Chairman Volcker intended his title to underscore that monetary policymakers in 1979 were confronted with a severe test in the form of high inflation and high inflation expectations. I use the title today to underscore that monetary policymakers in 2013 are again confronted with a severe test. But this time, a test created by low employment and low employment expectations. Back in 1979, Chairman Volcker said that this is a time of testing, a testing not only of our capacity collectively to reach coherent and intelligent policies, but to stick with them. And I have emphasized those, those uh, four words in my text, and I'll try to emphasize them verbally as much as I can, to stick with them. My theme today is that this powerful phrase applies with equal force to our current situation. Let me give you a brief road map of where I plan to take you today. First, hopefully, I will show you data <laughs> that depict the painfully slow pace of recovery in the U.S. labor market. Second, I will show you data that demonstrate that there is considerable monetary policy capacity with which to address this problem. Third, I will take you back to 1979 and describe the nature of the problem that monetary policymakers faced then. I will describe how they dealt with those problems by using what I would term goal-oriented monetary policy. Fourth, I will argue that there are several key parallels between the situation in 1979 and the situation in 2013. Given those parallels, monetary policymakers can best deal with the current labor market problems by also adopting a goal-oriented approach to monetary policy. Unlike 1979, though, the goal-oriented approach to monetary policy will focus on improving labor market outcomes as opposed to lowering inflation. Throughout my remarks, I'll be making reference to the Federal Open Market Committee. Uh, and I'll be using the acronym FOMC for short. The committee con uh, currently consists of the six governors of the Federal Reserve System and the 12 presidents of the various uh, regional Federal Reserve Banks, in including me. Its job is to set monetary policy for the United States. So when I use the term FOMC, that's what you should have in your mind. But as you listen to me today, please keep in mind that my views are not necessarily those of anyone else in the Federal Reserve System, including other Federal Open Market Committee participants. So I'll begin by talking about the state of the labor market. And if you uh, look at the, the, the behavior of the unemployment rate, in March of 2007, which is about six and a half years ago, the unemployment rate nationally was 4.4%. It rose slowly throughout 2007 to reach 5.0% by the end of the year, if you get to, to December. The National Bureau of Economic Research dates the Great Recession as having begun in that month, in December of 2007. In the wake of the recession, the unemployment uh, rate reached a peak of 10% in October 2009. So we're at 4.4 in March of 07, 5 at the end of, uh, of 07 in December, 
and then it shoots upward to a peak of 10% in October 2009. Since that date, almost four years ago, the unemployment rate has fallen slowly. It has fallen to 7.3%. This is still unusually high relative to the past quarter century or so. So if you look at the data between 1986 and 2007, the unemployment rate was only higher than 7.3% in one year, 1992. This is where the, that 4.4% I was talking about down here, see the recession, that's that gray shaded area. It's data between the end of 2007 and, and the middle of 2009. See the unemployment rate, it actually continues to rise after the end of the recession, starts to come down. We're down to 7.3%, but look at all these years in which the unemployment rate is actually lower than 7.3%. It's only in the, the 1992 uh, period where we, we see unemployment uh, ticking up above 7.3. Uh, the, the current unemployment rate, and this you don't see, but it's also true, the current unemployment rate is also high relative to most forecasts of its expected long-run level, so where we're expecting to go in the future, and including those forecasts made by the Federal Open Market Committee. Basically, unemployment rate of 7.3% means that the U.S. labor market is far from healthy. But I would say that this measure, troubling as it is, actually overstates the degree of improvement in the U.S. labor market. To estimate the unemployment rate, the U Census Bureau asks people two questions. Are you working? And if not, have you looked for work in the past four weeks? So the unemployment rate measures the ratio of the second number, the recent job searchers, the people who looked for work in the past four weeks, to the sum of the two numbers, the recent job searchers and the people who have a job. This means that the unemployment rate can decline for two reasons. Because more people are finding work, or because fewer people are choosing not to look for work. Most of the declines in the unemployment rate since October of 2009 have occurred because the fraction of people who are choosing to look for work has fallen. This characterization is borne out if we look at the following picture, which is the behavior, what's called the employment population ratio. This is the fraction of people over the age of 16 who have a job. Now again, if you go back to March of 2007, you know, just like the unemployment rate was very low then, the employment to population ratio was, was pretty high, it was at 63%. It wasn't as high as it was at the end of the, the, uh, the 1990s but it was up, uh, back up to 63% after the, uh, the recession that we see here. Then we see a very sharp fall. And it's down, this it gets down to around 58.2% or so here. <laughs> Look, we've made very little recovery, right? So we've seen a big sharp fall in the employment to population ratio. We've seen very little recovery. I mean, you would be hard pressed to see a recovery in this, in this number. Yeah, I, I think if you look at it, you might be 10% back from the very low point back to, to getting back to that 63%. Moreover, it remains lower than at any time between 1986 and 2007. You know, if you can go all the way, actually all the way back here to, to pretty much when I graduated from college, I think in the, in the in 1983 time frame, and to get back to a, an employment population ratio of the same, same level. Now, the employment population ratio, you have to be careful using it, to be, to be honest about it, because we're looking at everyone over the age of 16, and we know that um, this group is becoming increasingly shaded towards an older sector of the population, right? Because of the, we've got the, uh, the baby boom birth cohort, who was born between 1946 and 1964. As that cohort ages, the fraction of retirees in the population grows steadily, and that's gonna, that by itself would push downward on this number. The, but these demographic forces are simply too small to account for much of the decline in the employment to population ratio that I've described. So one way to see this, but not the only way, is to focus on people who are outside the normal retirement age. So we, we see this is the the fraction of the population aged 25 to 54 who have a job. Now, you see a very similar pattern here. You see a peak, I, 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 I'm not sure it's exactly March 2007, but somewhere in 2007, you see a peak there, 
a big sharp fall, the good news is we do see more of a recovery. Okay, here's the nadir, the low point here, and we're back up to a higher level. If you compare it to the picture I showed you earlier, the employment population ratio for everyone over the age of 16. Again, though, it's improved somewhat relative more from, uh, uh, more from its low point. But it remains lower than at any time uh, over the, uh, between, uh, since 1986. And again, if you go all the way back here, you see you have to go, all, again, around 1984 or so to, to get back to a point where we're at the same level. So I've shown you a lot of information, a lot of data. Let me try to summarize what we learned from these charts or what I think we learned from these charts. The good news is I, I do think that we see an improvement in the labor market since the end of the Great Recession. But the bad news is that the rate of improvement that we're seeing over the past four years has been painfully slow. And as a consequence, the condition of the labor market remains weak. Now I want to emphasize two aspects of the labor market situation. First, the weak labor market represents considerable hardship for a large number of Americans, both in economic terms and in psychological terms. Second, it represents a significant waste of resources for the national economy because our country is failing to use a large fraction of our human potential. For both of those reasons, I believe that those of us who are charged with making economic policy should do whatever we can to facilitate a faster rate of improvement than, we, than these pictures show, a faster rate of improvement in labor market conditions. Okay, so that's the state of the labor market. I've shown you evidence that the, uh, that the labor market is currently weak. The charts, though, also document that the labor market has been weak for several years. <clears throat> so, and some observers have concluded from this persistent weak condition that monetary policy cannot ameliorate the problems in the labor market. One of my main points today is that this conclusion of monetary policy impotence is at odds with the behavior of inflation. So see this, it's, uh, I think, helpful to look at the next slide, which is the behavior of personal consumption expenditure inflation over the past few years. This is a measure of inflation that the Fed likes better than the usual consumer price index. But just to be clear, it, I, mean, I think it does a better job of capturing um, what people spend money on. But the, the key thing, I think, uh, given the, some of the concerns you often hear about measures of inflation, is to emphasize that this is a measure of inflation that incorporates the prices of all goods and services including those that are linked to food and energy. Okay, so we're not stripping food and energy away. That would, if it were, I were doing that, I would label it core, and I'm not labeling it that. Now, what happens when we look at inflation? Well, since the beginning of the Great Recession in December 2007, the PC inflation rate has averaged around 1.5%. This is noticeably below the FOMC's target for inflation, which is this 2% line here. This is where the FOMC is trying to keep the inflation rate. And you can see before 2007, it, was, it went up, but it came back down. This is essentially where the FOMC would like to keep inflation. But we, uh, over this last uh, uh, six-year period, five, uh, nearly six-year period, it's actually inflation's averaged um, below one, uh, well below two, and is, in fact, right now, uh, remains well below 2%. Now, this is all about the past. But the outlook for future inflation is similarly subdued. So uh, uh, let me give you an outside estimate. The earlier this year, the Congressional Budget Office projected that PC inflation will remain below the FOMC's target of 2% until the year 2018, okay? five years. These low levels of inflation tell us that monetary policy can be useful in increasing the rate of improvement in the labor market. Now here's what I mean at the most basic level. Monetary stimulus increases demand for goods among households and firms. This higher demand for goods tends to push upward on both prices and employment. Okay, so you, you look, and you, 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 monetary stimulus is going to push up on demand, that's going to push up on prices, push up on employment. The downside with using monetary policy to stimulate employment is that if employment is near its maximum level, further stimulus can lead to unduly high inflation. But the data show that over the past few years, inflation has averaged below the FOMC's target of 2%, and it's expected to remain below desirable levels for years to come. 
these low levels of inflation show that the FOMC has a lot of room to provide much needed stimulus to the labor market. Okay. So I've just argued that there is uh, monetary policy capacity to ameliorate the severe weakness in U.S. labor market conditions. I next turn to the question of how best to use that capacity. Now, in answering that question, I think it's useful to consider how the Federal Open Market Committee successfully solved a different problem, the problem of high inflation back in the early 1980s. So earlier, I referred to a speech given by Paul Volcker in October 1979, early in his term as chairman of the FOMC. At that time, the annual inflation rate was over 9% after rising throughout the prior 15 years. Now, I think what's hard to remember in the wake of, of what I'm going to describe the FOMC success, it's hard to remember the, this, this point. Many observers felt that monetary policy was powerless to roll back or possibly even a stem, this steady increase that I talked about over the, the pre preceding 15 years. As Chairman Volcker noted in his speech, some would argue that inflation is so bound up with deep-seated forces that monetary and fiscal policies are impotent. And, he went on to say, they would argue that we face impossible choices between inflation and prosperity. So I, I mentioned this speech was given October 9, 1979. Only 10 days earlier, before Chairman Volcker spoke, former Federal Reserve Chairman Arthur Burns spoke and gave a speech of his own, in which he argued that the increase in inflation was grounded, to use his words, philosophic and political currents that have been transforming economic life in the United States since the 1930s. This is exactly the, the kind of perception that, that Chairman Volcker makes reference to. The perception that monetary policymakers could not or would not address the problem of high inflation was actually a key part of the problem facing the FOMC in 1979. If the public believes that it is impossible to reduce inflation, then the public will expect high inflation to persist or even to increase. Those high inflation expectations themselves generate high inflation. After all, if businesses expect high inflation, they will raise their prices more. And if workers expect high inflation, they will ask for higher wage increases. In this way, the perception of monetary policy impotence in 1979 was itself a key force in generating higher inflation. So faced with this challenging issue, the Federal Open Markets Committee, the FOMC, followed what I would term goal-oriented monetary policy. Now, this approach had two parts. First, the committee formulated and communicated a clear goal, and that goal was it intended to bring down inflation as quickly as possible. Second, on an ongoing basis, the committee did whatever it took to achieve that goal, even if those actions had short-term economic costs. In particular, the committee maintained tight monetary policy so as to push down inflation, even as interest rates and, and the unemployment rate soared to post-World War II uh, highs. And I, as I look around the room, I suspect some of you actually remember those days. I, I do myself, actually. So. By following a goal-oriented policy, the FOMC was successful in bringing down inflation and inflation expectations. So I, I, I talked about Chairman Volcker's speech in 1979. By as soon as early, as soon as uh, 19, late at 1983, inflation had fallen below 4%. With the benefit of hindsight, I think it's clear why the FOMC was so successful. With goal-oriented policy, communications and actions work together in a powerful fashion. Communications tell the public where the FOMC is taking the economy and that every subsequent action gives the public confidence that the committee is willing and able to take the economy in that direction. Actions and communications operate together to destroy the dangerous perception of monetary policy impotence and ineffectiveness. So I've spent a lot of time talking about 1979, um, and it's because I see three key parallels 
between the economic situation in then and the economic situation now. First, just like in 1979, the Federal Open Market Committee faces a challenging macroeconomic problem. Although this time, as I, I've shown you in my, my charts, this time the problem is stubbornly low employment as opposed to stubbornly high inflation. Second, there is a widespread perception that monetary policymakers lack either the tools or the will to solve this problem. And third, the perception of monetary policy ineffectiveness is itself a key factor in generating the problem. Let me elaborate on this last point. If the public thinks that monetary policy is ineffective, then it will expect relatively weak macroeconomic conditions in the future. But those expectations about the future have a direct impact on current macroeconomic outcomes. If households expect their incomes to be low in the future, they will save more and spend less. If businesses expect low future demand for their products, they will invest less today and hire people, fewer people today. It's exactly these expectations. I mean, in our business leadership um, uh, meeting we had this morning, the, the two words we heard, I, I think would summarize the feelings of most people in the room, is the two words, cautious optimism. It's exactly these expectations of low future demand that translate into the cautious optimism that, that uh, I think summarize the attitude of the people in the room uh, uh, quite, quite effectively. It's in this way that perceptions of future FOMC ineffectiveness are in fact, um, the future FOMC ineffectiveness in generating favorable future macroeconomic outcomes are hurting current employment. Now we've seen how the FOMC dealt with its problems in 1979 by adopting a goal-oriented approach to monetary policy. Given the parallels that I've just argued exist between 1979 and 2013, I believe that a goal-oriented approach would be useful again. In 1979, the FOMC's goal was to return inflation to low levels as rapidly as it could. In 2013, the FOMC's goal should be to return employment to its maximal level as rapidly as it can, while still keeping inflation close to, although possibly temporarily above, the target of 2% that I, I mentioned earlier. Note that by keeping inflation expectations well anchored, this inflation requirement that we stay close to, although possibly temporarily above 2%, that inflation requirement ensures that monetary policy will remain effective as a form of employment stimulus. So that's the goal. But as Paul Volcker said in his 1979 speech, it is not enough to formulate or communicate a goal. The committee has to stick to its formulated approach. That is, it must do whatever it takes to achieve its communicated goal. In the early 1980s, doing whatever it took being, meant being willing to keep money tight even though interest rates and the unemployment rate rose to unusual heights. By doing whatever it took to achieve its goal, despite these short-term costs, the FOMC was able to bring down inflation and inflation expectations. Doing whatever it takes in the next few years will mean something different. It will mean that the FOMC is willing to continue to use the unconventional monetary policy tools that it has empl employed in the past few years. Indeed, it will mean that the FOMC is willing to use any of its congressionally authorized tools to achieve the goal of higher employment, no matter how unconventional those tools might be. Moreover, doing whatever it takes will mean keeping a historically unusual amount of monetary stimulus in place and possibly providing even more stimulus, even as interest rates remain near historic lows, Economic growth rises above historical averages. We need economic growth to be faster than historically averaged in order to, to make uh, more progress in employment. Per capita employment begins to rise appreciably. Asset prices rise to unusually high levels, leading to concerns about bubbles. And the medium term inflation outlook rises temporarily above 2%. It may not be able to stick to this path of providing uh, a high level monetary accommodation even as these conditions that I just described materialize. But I anticipate that the benefits of doing so in terms of employment gains will be significant. I've been emphasizing the similarities between the FOMC situation in 1979 and situation 2013. But I should emphasize one critical difference too. In 1979 the FOMC was faced with what proved to be a very painful trade-off between 
getting inflation low and keeping uh, employment high. There is no such trade-off in 2013. As I showed you earlier, the impact of the Great Recession is that both prices and employment too low. The goal-oriented policy I just described would also help the FOMC do better with its other objective of keeping inflation close to 2%. Now, before I wrap up, I'll note that the FOMC's current policy strategy differs in an important way from the goal-oriented approach that I'm recommending today. In its most recent statement, the committee says that appropriate monetary policy should lead the unemployment rate to decline gradually and lead the inflation rate to be below 2% over the medium term. Under a goal-oriented approach to policy, the FOMC would view a gradual decline in the unemployment rate as being undesirably slow, given that the medium-term outlook for inflation is so low. The committee's outlook that I just described would be a triggering point for a decision to provide more monetary stimulus. Let me conclude. My speech is called A Time of Testing. Five years ago, in September 2008, as the nation of the world spiraled into a financial crisis, it was obvious that economic policymakers faced a time of testing. Thanks in large part to Chairman Ben Bernanke's strong and imaginative leadership, the Federal Reserve System was able to pass that challenging test. The system's actions in the fall of 2008 and the first half of 2009 were critical in eliminating what was the non-trivial risk of a second Great Depression, with unemployment rates closer to 25% than to 10%. My message today is that September 2013 is another time of testing. Over six years after the national unemployment rate began, first began its ascent, the labor market remains disturbingly weak. The good news is that with low inflation, the FOMC has considerable monetary policy capacity at its disposal with which to address this problem. The FOMC's test today is to figure out how best to deploy this capacity. And I think the answer lies in taking two steps. The first is to communicate that our goal is to accomplish a fast return to max employment while keeping inflation close to, although possibly temporarily above, the target of 2%. The second step is to do whatever it takes on an ongoing basis to achieve that goal. A goal-oriented approach to monetary policy greatly reduced inflation in the early 1980s, and adopting such an approach in our own time would help improve labor market outcomes. Thank you very much for listening. I, I look forward to taking your questions.